अस्सलाम वालेकुम एवरीवन फर्स्ट ऑफ ऑल आई एम डॉक्टर जरीन किरण एंड आई एम असिस्टेंट प्रोफेसर इन द डाउ यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ हेल्थ साइंसेस वी शॉल बिगिन दिस कोर्स एंड दिस लेक्चर टुडे विद द तिलावत कुरान ओवर टू यू नासिर साहब प्लीज डू द रेसिटी उदास Jazakallah. Let's formally begin with the uh, course today. First of all, let me introduce the course. This is a first online course which has been organized by the National Institute of Diabetes and Endocrinology, Dow University of Health Sciences. It has thirteen lectures, and uh, each lecture has one credit hour. So we have total thirteen CME credit hours, and you will be getting the end uh, certificate course at the end of the course with all these credits if you register each course. um every sunday um i'm thankful to uh, my director professor dr akhtar ali baloch who helped me out and who urged me to design this course as well as my other faculty members who helped me out in organizing this and of course baritson hodson who came forward to you know participate in this academic activity uh now i wish i'll introduce today's speaker we all know him very well but let me give a background and you know tell us revive us with what he is uh, sir professor saeed e meher is uh, has graduated from liaquat university of medical and health sciences jamshoro sindh and then he did his uh, residency in internal medicine from civil hospital karachi dow university of health sciences and did his fcps in internal medicine after that he uh, did his fellowship in diabetes and technology and metabolism from aa khan university hospital and uh, he sir has been awarded with the fellowship of american college of physicians uh, american college of endocrinology and also uh, from the royal college of physicians uh, uk uh, sir said mayor saab has been uh, an, 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 a speaker in the in several national and international forums we all have heard him before as well um uh, and he has several pub publications in the uh, several national and international peer reviewed journals uh dr saeed mehr saab is also a supervisor and examiner of the fcps endocrinology exam from the college of physicians and surgeons of pakistan and at present he is working as professor of medicine and consultant endocrinologist in the national institute of cardiovascular diseases as well as he is the consultant endocrinologist in the aakhan university hospital a uh, very warm welcome to you sir Uh, and thank you so much for sparing your uh, precious time for us on a sunday which is not very easy with all the hectic schedule uh there is a slight change in the format today we are not going to have uh, polling questions uh, because uh, the lecture which is which we are going to listen now is uh, totally scenario based and have lot of questions in in itself so we will skip that part today so without much delay i'll hand over to the uh, speaker uh, to uh said mehr saab over to you sir okay beta pa <clears throat> just just give me one minute that i can share my screen uh, with you all guys okay i think so you all can see it now yes sir we can see the screen okay first of all uh, thank you very much uh, professor akhtar baloch and dr zareen kiran for inviting me for this course and be a part of this prestigious course and i must appreciate the efforts 
of Professor Akhtar Baloch and Dr. Zareen Pran for arranging this online endocrine course, which is really very helpful for the uh, young healthcare professionals to learn something on a Sunday uh, sitting at their home. So we start with it. Usually I, I make this lecture, you might have heard before because this is the presentation which I did earlier in a couple of occasions. This is, this is some case-based scenarios of hyperthyroidism that how we will do that. So the format is that there is introduction. So then what is the difference between thyrotoxicosis and hyperthyroidism? What are the various causes? How to differentiate the causes and what is the appropriate treatment as per the cause? Because every hyperthyroid patient is not the patient to be treated with the antithyroid drugs that I will prove today that every patient is not a patient to be treated with the antithyroid drugs. Now, hyperthyroidism is basically the overactivity of the thyroid gland leading to the excessive synthesis of thyroid hormones and accelerated metabolism in the peripheral tissue. The secretion of thyroid hormones is no longer under the regulatory control of the hypothalamic pituitary axis. Two terms we usually represent or use interchangeably. One is actually the hyper uh, thyrotoxicosis, which is actually the clinical syndrome of hypermetabolism and hyperactivity, which results from the excessive thyroid hormones, irrespective of the etiology. Second is the hyperthyroidism, which denotes the sustained increase in the thyroid hormone biosynthesis and secretion by the thyroid gland. What could be the causes of thyroid hyperthyroidism? Multiple causes. I have put them in, 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 the, in the, the, the commoner the causes. First, so Graves disease on the top, then Plummer's disease or toxic multinodular goiter, toxic phase of subacute thyroiditis, toxic single adenoma, pituitary tumors, molar pregnancy and choriocarcinoma, metastatic thyroid cancers, stroma aura, and thyrotoxicosis fasciata. Now, if, if, if I give the outline, usually the top four are very common in our uh, these settings. And usually for healthcare professionals, which are not doing pure endocrinology, I think so top four one are more than enough to look into, but I will give you a flavor of all, all these the uh, categories. So case one, a uh, 32 year old medical doctor presented with one year history of weight loss, about seven kilos, palpitations, heat intolerance and tremors, scanty but regular menses, height 160 centimeter, weight 47 kilograms, BMI 18.3, BP 120 plus as 70 pulse is 100 per minute, she has got bilateral proptosis right, more than the left with the lid lag. Thyroid is grade two, diffuse goiter, buoy is positive. She has got tremors of both the hands, moist and warm palms. Lab data, 3T4 is 3.3. DSH is separate, 0.02. Antibodies are positive. I think so, this, this gives you a fair idea that what could be the diagnosis, those who are practicing it. So what could be the diagnosis? We'll come on that. Treatment plan, what should be there? Antithyroid drugs versus radioactive iodine. Now, this, this is very obvious that she has got the Graves disease. The option is that, or the question arises, which drug should be used? The PTU versus methamazole. How long it should be treated? How the, does the drug influence the chances of remission? Should we co-administer the the T4 or thyroxine, we said block and replace the regimen. And if this patient a good candidate for a primary antithyroid therapy, or she is unlikely to achieve remission and making radioactive iodine Y131 a better initial choice. We'll talk and we'll give the answers of all these. So as I said earlier, she has got Graves disease and which is again, one of the most common cause of thyrotoxicosis and 50 to 60% of the patient has got the Graves disease. Other autoimmune disease, which may 
be related to this, the most important auto antibody which we do see in the graves disease is the thyroid stimulating immunoglobulin tsi or trap or tsh receptor antibody some of the labs in karachi are doing it the trap tsi access a proxy to the tsh and stimulates the t4 and t3 and that is actually causing the thyrotoxicosis anti thyroid oxidase or anti tpo antibodies that anti thyroglobulin or anti microsomal antibodies they are also usually being done in these cases other specific autoimmune diseases should be looked when there is one autoimmune disease the dictum of endocrine is that look for another autoimmune disease like pernicious anemia type 1 diabetes rheumatoid arthritis myasthenia gravis vitiligo and adrenal insufficiency this is something which i said earlier this is a normal thyroid gland on your left side which you can see but on the right side if you can see the uptake is clearly marked in both the both the lobes of the thyroid and that clearly shows that this is graves disease another case a 40 year old lady with 10 year history of non toxic multinodular goiter presented to gynecology clinic with irregular menses anxiety palpitations fatigue and weight loss bmi 29 bp of 126 126 by 60 pulse stegocardic 126 beats per minute temperature of 36.8 degrees centigrade thyroid is grade 2 multinodular she has got no bruit no proptosis she has got a mild leg leg fine tremors moist and palm warms lab data again clearly hyperthyroid with a free t4 of 2.19 tsh is suppressed with 0.019 antibodies or negative thyroid scan two hot nodules with poor uptake in the rest of the nodule so what is the diagnosis and what the treatment plan so this is very obvious from the history she has got toxic multinodular goiter and usually the best plan in these patients is that you make them u thyroid and then put them or send them for radioactive iodine ablation this is the most common uh, the the cause of hyperthyroidism uh, the usually the toxic multinodular goiter it's more common in elderly individuals long standing goiter bumpy lumpy thyroid gland mild manifestations apathetic hyperthyroidism mild elevations of the free t4 and free t3 progressive slowly over time clinically can you hear me all ji sir bilkul Yes, sir. Your voice is yes, clear, sir. sir. Because actually, most probably the light is gone, so I was thinking that you 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 might as not hearing me. So anyway, so we continue with it. That this is actually the toxic multinodular goiter that that gives the the picture that the these actually has got the multiple toxic nodule. Okay, you can see that has got the increased or more radioactive iodine uptake in 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 these patients. this is what you see when actually you see that if you take the the thyroid out in these patient this is how it looks like the of after the uh, thyroid surgery toxic multinodular goiter in these patients now toxic single adenoma the toxic single adenoma is a single hyper functioning follicular thyroid adenoma it's a benign monoclonal tumor that usually is large larger than 2.5 cm it is the cause in 5% of the patients who are thyrotoxic nuclear scan shows only a single hot nodule tsh is usually suppressed by the thyroid hormone excess so the rest of the thyroid gland is suppressed if i show you yes this is very clear this is this is which is black in color is the toxic adenoma and the rest of the thyroid gland is suppressed in these patients this is again the same a single toxic adenoma and the rest of the thyroid gland is basically suppressed now another case a 28 year old lady presented with two weeks history of fever neck pain palpitations heat intolerance and fatigue weight is 50 kg blood pressure is 120 by 70 and Pulse is 120 beats per minute. Temperature: she is febrile. 
with 101 degree Fahrenheit. Fahrenheit is diffused grade two, extremely tender on touch. It moves with the swallowing, uh, no eye signs, mild tremor with the both ends. Again, lab data, 3T4 is 2.4, TSH is 0 0.03, ESR is 100. So she's again clearly toxic with the ESR of 100, antibodies are negative. So which one of the following treatment options is appropriate for the patient? PTU, carbimazole, radioactive iodine ablation, surgery, and prednisolone. So most probably you might have came through that this is this is the this is the case of acute subacute thyroiditis, and usually steroids or prednisolone is the treatment of choice in, in, in these patients. Now, subacute thyroiditis is the next most common hyperthyroidism. 15% of the cases, T4 and T3 are extremely elevated in this condition. Immune destruction of thyroid due to the viral infection, destruct, destructive release of preformed thyroid hormones, thyroid gland is painful on tender and palpation, nuclear scan, no radioactive iodine uptake in the gland, and treatment is NSAIDs with the corticosteroids. This is how you see that, that usually there is no uptake in the gland. You can clearly see there is no uptake in the gland. This is normal thyroid and this is no uptake. This uptake in the top is actually of the, in the salivary glands. Another case, a 28 year, 24 year old Gravida one with the 10 weeks of gestation presented with severe nausea and vomiting of two weeks duration had recently lost five kilograms in weight, BP 100 by 65, pulse is 120, excessive sweating and tremors of vein, small, diffuse, grade one goiter, no brewery, no ophthalmopathy. Lab data again shows TSH is suppressed with the 0 0.04, T4 is 14, antibodies are negative. So what could it be? It'd be at Graves, subacute painless thyroiditis, gestational HCG induced thyrotoxicosis, postpartum thyroiditis or toxic nodular goiter. So this is very clear that she has got gestational HCG induced thyrotoxicosis and what could be the treatment? Yes, absolutely agree. Usually hydration and propranol is more than enough in these patients because another case, a 25 year old woman is evaluated because of three weeks history of palpitations and increased sweating. She, she gave birth to a healthy baby three months ago and has taken a six month maternity leave from her job. The patient intends to continue nursing her baby until she returns to work. She has no history of thyroid disease. Pulse is 94 beats per minute and, and uh, thyroid is gland is slightly enlarged but non-nodular. Non Lab data, 3T4 is 3.1, TSH is, is 0.02. So which one of the following is the treatment option inappropriate for this patient? Carbimazole, PTU, propranolol, or prednisolone. Absolutely right. So she has, she needs only the, she has got postpartum thyroiditis and only she needs the propranolol or control of the heart rate and that will really resolve with passage of the time. Another case, a 31 year old man is referred by the Karachi Psychiatric Hospital for fluctuating testosterone levels, sexual weakness and feeling of fear, has a normal sense of smell, no weight loss or, or, or gain recently. BP 125 by 80, pulses and eight beats per minute, weight 62.75. The adenic lack of facial hair, thyroid not palpable, no gynecomastia, axillary hair stage two and three, genital exam, phallus is normal, adult pubic hair, the Stage four here, scrotum is small for age. Test is right, six ml, left at ml. Laps, prolactin 6.5, LH.3, testosterone of 21, really low testosterone. Fasting sugar is 89. FT4 is 2.8, TSH is 6.4, ACTH is non detected, cortisol is 0.4. So, which one of the following is the most appropriate diagnosis for this patient? Graves, TSH producing pituitary Coleman syndrome causing hypogonadism, Klinefelter syndrome, or Addison's. A little bit tricky and difficult for the, the junior colleagues. If you see 
that the that the GSH and free T4 both are high, and that usually uh, indicates towards the central cause or the pituitary. So most probably she he has she, the this person has got a TSH producing pituitary adenoma that is causing hyperthyroidism. Another case, a 42 year old man is seen in the ER with the sinus tachycardia. She's she's massively obese, but has lost 14.5 kilogram in the past three months. BP 145 by 70, pulse is tachycardic. Uh, she has stare, but no proptosis. Her thyroid is not palpable, but marked obesity makes examination difficult. Tremors are present, and she has decreased muscle strength. Free T4 is 2.9, TSH is suppressed. 24 of a reductive adenine ablation uptake is 0.3, thyroglobulin is 0.5. She has got decreased uptake, free T4 is high, TSH is decreased. So what could be the cause? Subacute thyroiditis, stroma ovari, silent lymphocytic thyroiditis, or thyrotoxicosis fasciata, or recent iodine exposure. Again, something which is not very common to understand for, for the junior colleagues. Usually, if, if the, the hint is that, that she has got the uh, decreased, uh, decreased, decreased uptake plus thyroglobulin is low. So, usually, she is taking thyroxine from outside. To reduce the weight, or so, you, so usually she has thyrotoxicosis fasciata or exogenous thyrotoxicosis. Now, coming to the common problems, graves usually in the range of 20 to 40 years, toxic multinodular goiter more than 50, toxic single adenoma 35 to 50, subacute thyroiditis it can be any age. Male to female ratio, graves 1.5 to 1, toxic multinodular goiter 1 to 2, 1.4. If I show you again, this is a normal thyroid gland on top left, then right top is Graves disease, increased uptake, then left bottom is toxic multinodal goiter with multiple toxic nodule, and right bottom is toxic adenoma with single toxic nodule. Now, clinical features, there are certain which which occur with any types of thyrotoxicosis that are specific to the sun. Some are specific to the Graves disease and non-specific changes of hypermetabolism, like common symptoms of hyperthyroidism, nervousness, anxiety, increased perspiration, heat intolerance, tremors, hyperactivity, palpitations, weight loss, despite increased appetite, reduction in menstrual flow or oligomenorrhea in females. It's specific to the Graves disease, diffuse, painless, and firm enlargement of the thyroid gland. Bruit is audible with the bell of the stethoscope. Ophthalmopathy or eye manifestations usually are, are there in, in, in these patients. And the dermopathy, usually the limb manifestations are there. Now, if I can show you that how, how they respond or how they are there, this is, this is proptosis, the on top, usually this white sclera is, is not visible in a normal person and this lower one is shows actually the lid lag. Again, uh, the periorbital edema, which is very obvious in this patient and chemosis. Then this is again the same periorbital edema, which is and, uh, of exophthalmos is very common, with very, very obvious in this patient. Pretibial mixed edema, which is again a, a feature of the hyperthyroidism. Clubbing and osteoarthropathy is definitely cl clearly there. Onycholysis is again something which we may not see regularly, but definitely this is there in, in some of these patients. Now, diagnosis, if there is a typical a clinical presentation where there is a marked TSA, 3T4 is elevated, and, and thyroid antibodies are, are their eye signs, usually that uh, uh, they points towards the Graves disease ECG demonstrates the cardiac manifestation. And if you want to differentiate in problem cases when you're not sure about it, then the thyroid scintigraphy differentiate the cases. Now, how you treat? Now, the two things. One is the symptomatic relief uh, of the, these drugs. Then the antithyroid drugs, carbimazole, methimazole, or PTU. Usually, we use PTU in the first trimester of the pregnancy. And the rest of the trimester, we use neomacazole. And the rest of the patients, usually we use neomacazole. Once the patient is euthyroid, usually we treat the patients of hyperthyroidism 
if someone has got the graves for 18 months or 24 months, then there's a chance that 50% of the patients will go into remission. If the patient will not go into remission till that time, then usually make the patient do thyroid and put them or send them for radioactive iodine ablation. Then if someone has got the uh, toxic multinodular goiter, as I said earlier, make them do thyroid, send them for radioactive iodine ablation. Thyroidectomy is another option with large goiters and the, the, the compressive symptom if someone has got NSAID and corticosteroids are used for subacute thyroiditis. Rehydration usually is the first step. Then beta blocker decrease the sympathetic access. Usually we use propranolol, atinolol, or metoprolol. Rate limiting effect if someone has got a contraindications like asthma, then you can use the, the calcium channel blockers for head, the rate, head, heart rate control. And definitely if someone has got the CHA for arrhythmia, you definitely simultaneously control that also. Now, usually the if we start somebody usually with the higher doses and it usually takes four to six weeks to come to a level then usually after four to six weeks we usually send them that check your free t4 and come to us because usually tsh will take three months or usually more than three months so it will it may remain suppressed so usually we check the free t4 and treat accordingly um, and adjust the dose accordingly and usually with multinodular goiter toxic adenoma we usually make them use thyroid and treat them with the radioactive iodine ablation or surgery. In women who are not pregnant, in case of toxic multinodular goiter, Graves disease and TSA, Graves disease, if not remitting antithyroid, then definitely we, we ask them for the radioactive iodine ablation. And it's usually effective, simple, and it, it's contraindicated in patients who are pregnant and patients who are lactating. So we should not give radioactive iodine to the pregnant woman or planning to pregnant, planning for a pregnancy or someone who are uh, the breastfeeding the baby. There are very minimum side effects. Usually the patient is, is away from the small children for 48, 72 hours. And usually the majority of them, they tolerate it very well. Iodine 131 is, is used for nuclear scintigraphy. I131 is given for the radioactive iodine ablation. And goal is to make the patient hypothyroid, no effects such as thyroid C or the malignancies. Usually they are not reported with the uh, radioactive iodine therapy in these patients. Where the surgery is indicated when the, there is severe hypothyroidism in children, pregnant women who cannot tolerate the antithyroid drugs, large goiters with severe ophthalmopathy, large multinodular goiters with pressure symptoms and who require quick normalization of the thyroid function due to the cardiac failure and other symptoms, then these are some of the, the, the indications of actually the, the surgery. And you are the base judge to decide about which patients need surgery when you are treating them. Thank you very much for your attention. I love to give answers if there are any that if you ask for that. Back to you, Dr. Zareen. Uh, thank you. Thank you. So thank you so much, sir, for your lovely lecture. Uh, I'm sure everybody must have enjoyed the case-based drilling. And uh, we do have questions, I think. Okay. Uh, since the format is a bit changed, we don't have any other polling system. So we'll, we are directly jumping into question answers. Uh, so there's one question I want to ask when to treat hyperthyroidism in pregnant women uh, based on clinical and biochemical parameter, like in, if is four present after 20 weeks, should we treat her or not? Now, usually, as I said, in one of my cases, usually to, during the first trimester, it is the, the, usually the gestational hyperthyroidism, and it's usually it's not being treated with actually the antithyroid drugs, but the, you are the best that you see that someone who has got already history of thyroid, she may be taking the medicine. She left the medicine again during the pregnancy. She got the exacerbated. But if someone who is, who is coming after the 12 weeks, 16 weeks, and 20 weeks, and she's clear, clear cut hyperthyroid, then definitely these are the patients who need treatment for hyperthyroidism in pregnancy also. Okay, thank you, sir. There's another question uh, regarding case one. What do you suggest as initial treatment? 
anti tumor drug or radioactive iodine yes so this is again which 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 i have already have very clearly elaborated in my cases in all the all the cases of hyperthyroidism usually initial management is always with the anti thyroid drugs and usually here we use the metamazole make the patient you thyroid whether it is toxic multinodular goiter single toxic adenoma where the definitive treatment is the radioactive iodine but when the patient is in a hyperthyroid state it's better to make them you thyroid and then you send them for the radioactive iodine treatment in cases of the graves disease as i said earlier in my presentation usually we give them a trial for 18 months to 24 months if the patient is going into remission it's fine if it is not going into the remission then the radioactive iodine ablation is the treatment another option when the patient choose that they would do not want to take the drug in the graves for so long time then we give them an option that if you do not take the drugs make the, them you thyroid and then we send them for the radioactive iodine ablation in these cases also yes so um, i think we don't have much more questions uh, uh, participants and attendees if you have any other question you can write in the question answer box we cannot allow you to talk because it's a webinar set uh, dr kamal want to i think she has raised hand so if you can write on the chat box okay there is one question in the chat box hmm. one married woman 30 years treated for grays she become youth thyroid and she is on numercus on one numercusol 5 mg for 18 to 24 months but her family needs pregnancy now how i think what she mean to say then how to proceed now what to do now if she is youth thyroid already on a numercusol I, i would not like to change her to any, any other drug you can you can you can make them youth thyroid and allow them yes she she can go for the pregnancy or pregnancy the medicine if she want if she want the xe or something like that but once the pregnancy test is positive we change this medicine to the ptu this is also i've shown in my in my presentation that in the first trimester of the pregnancy ptu is preferred than the than the metamazole in these patients but someone who is already on on a on a metamazole or numercusol and is you thought i want to go for pregnancy i do not want to change that patient uh someone sir has uh, put a question but I, even i can't understand uh, maria noor if you can elaborate on your question uh, what did you mean by control is not included in the hypothalamic pituitary axis uh for thyroid control of course we uh, want our biochemical control as well as clinical but i don't know what do you mean by hypothalamus and pituitary axis i think you should elaborate on your question okay attendees if you have any other question then please write it on the your question answer box we still have time and professor saab is with us we can avail his you know expertise and his time with us so please kindly put your questions on the question answer box okay can symptoms overlap in which country okay okay there is one question uh, when should we suspect sa interference in interference of uh, i think free t4 that you mean to say uh, and that is in context of uh, pregnancy or is it questions ko please thoda sa elaborate karke likhein what i what do you want to ask sa interferences sare hormones mein hote hain Three to four के लिए भी होती है, but in which context are you asking? In okay, we uh, someone has asked that if uh, thyroid hyperthyroid uh, symptoms can overlap in pregnancy, then how to differentiate? Probably that is the question they want to ask. again again uh, i have clearly shown you a case in my case series that the initial initial uh, the the pregnancy induced thyrotoxicosis in the first trimester usually the symptoms of hyperthyroidism but there this is uh, this is new the true hyperthyroidism when they are not being treated with actually the anti thyroid drugs usually the propranolol and hydration is more than enough so yes symptoms can be overlap 
but if i if, if i need it if, if i need it uh, if i elaborate or i want to understand do not only rely on the labs there are certain labs which may not give you the right picture so your clinical decision your clinical acumen is more important than the labs clinically examine the patient whether you see that your patient is clinically you thought or hyper thought that's more important if you still see that the lab is saying your patient is is you thought and you see clinically that the patient is, is still tachycardic patient has got still tremors then it's better to repeat these labs from some other lab or rep and then decide accordingly Okay, so that ascent affairs question now it is more clear. Uh, what they want to ask is when should we suspect any essay interference in interpretation of thyroid function test? This is again which I have just 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 answered that you see the patient clinically. So if your patient you, you think that the, the SA says that it's a you thyroid, but your clinical acumen says that no, this patient is hyperthyroid, then definitely you you will you, you will repeat the labs from some reliable lab. because we all do see dr zarin is is there we all do endocrinologists see the assays from the different labs where there is interference or maybe maybe some other problem where the where they report as the youth are at but the patient is clearly hyperthyroid and we, when we repeat these assays from some reliable lab the data mm -hmm. is really different so it's always better to repeat it from some reliable lab and then you accordingly adjust the dose So, as a B, we have a rule that in endocrine or in any other clinical condition, first go, first evaluate clinically and then biochemically, because Agreed. labs can always give you false reports. There can be errors. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, okay. There is a question, sir. Uh, someone has put a scenario: a uh, fifty years old female with multinodular goiter without any hyperthyroid symptoms. Her TSH is below normal with normal free T4 for five years. what should be the management okay so, so this, is, this is something which is which we call it a subclinical hyperthyroidism now in subclinical hyperthyroidism there are certain certain areas in which we always look into in someone who has got subclinical hyperthyroidism so we look definitely whether she is tachycardic or not number 1 number 2 whether she has got symptom she is losing weight or not number 3 is she become osteoporotic or not number 3 and definitely if i would like to do a, a scan in this patient if someone there is there is a cold nodule definitely i may go for the biopsy of that nodule and if all these conditions are there which i already elaborated then yes this this patient may need a small dose of uh, anti thyroid drugs also but if she hasn't got anything any anything like that which i already elaborated then you may just follow that patient okay so there are many questions coming up uh, so how long beta blocker can be prescribed on safer side in first trimester for symptomatic purpose provided past history of iogr well, that that's something which is, which is uh, i think so better being asked by the gynecologist because we we always try to give the minimum beta blockers during especially the first trimester also that we have we are, that that's the reason that we we do see that these beta blockers also interfere with the with the pregnancy so if someone is clearly hyperthyroid so definitely the anti thyroid drugs with beta blocker is the ideal but because we we want to make patients you thyroid so definitely if you only give the beta blocker you you need a very high doses of the beta blockers which is not advisable in a pregnant woman but if someone is hyperthyroid clearly then yes you give the anti thyroid drugs a small dose of beta blocker and usually they become you thyroid then you discontinue with the the beta blockers and you continue with the anti thyroid drugs thank you sir um so people have asked about uh, if, what to monitor during pregnancy free t3 free t4 or total and what are the targets of uh, usually, hormonal targets usually, usually this again depends in in pregnancy we you i just agree we we do do check the total t4 also and we usually keep keep actually the levels at the at the of the upper level or one and a half more than the one and a half of the upper level but we do do check the free t4 also simultaneously and we do not try to keep a very tighter control or free t4 or t4 at the lower level but usually the t4 one and a half time at the upper level of the normal in these patients 
Okay, sir, I think there's a, this has been a good discussion and a lot of good questions and questions as well. And uh, I hope attendees have understood very well because sir has explained very thoroughly and with all his, his uh, clinical experience and practical experience. Um, there is still one question which is uh, related to your comment probably in the beginning of the lecture that uh, you said, probably you mentioned that TSH release is no longer under control of hypothalamic and pituitary axis. I think this is in context of that pituitary, uh, TSH producing pituitary adenoma. So, so would you yeah, like to comment on that this? That was a little bit a, a difficult scenario. It may be not mm -hmm. for the common or healthcare professional. We do endocrinologists see, but ju just to just to keep keep them, the, the, the uh, scenarios in their mind, that someone who is coming to you with, with the TSH, which is not suppressed, free T4, which is also high, then think about something which is in the pituitary. So usually when you look into the, the thyroid axis, what happens that when free T4 goes up and usually TSH is being suppressed. So in some context, it's very rare. I have seen in my 20 years practice, only two or three cases in my practice of these, these sort of uh, cases. So if you, just to complete actually the lecture, I just give you the scenario, but they are very rare. But if, if you see something like that, it's better to see or refer to someone who is specializing or, or someone doing endocrinology. Okay, so there's just one last question and I thought it's a bit relevant. That's why I'm uh, talking about it. Someone has asked about the role of diet in, in, you know, in hyperthyroidism. Causing hyperthyroidism. The diet is also a lot of people question what is it, what is it, what is it, what is it, what is it. I don't know. Honestly speaking, I haven't read anything specific about the guidelines which they say about the diet. So there is no specific diet about in hyperthyroidism which we, we ask the patient that to follow that particular diet. There is no specific diet for that. Yes. Okay, sir. Thank you so much, sir. Um, now I would like to, uh, you know, uh, I, would I would request our professor uh, Dr. Akhtar Ali Baloch, sir, kindly give your expert comments and your uh, comments regarding the whole activity. Over to you, sir. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam, sir. Wa alaikum assalam, sir. We can hear you. Wa alaikum assalam, sir. Sir, sir, I have a lot I would like to thank, first of all, uh, Professor. Uh, Mohammed uh, Said Mastop for sparing time on Sunday, especially which is a holiday, and delivering such a very nice elevator talk. Personally, I like the way he delivered it today, scenario based. The more teaching way of delivering lecture. And thank you so much, sir, uh, for a very good and excellent teaching session today. And we commonly see hyperthyroidism and hyperoxychosis in our clinical practices. Either we have junior colleagues or senior colleagues. And I think it will, uh, today's talk and discussion and teaching question will improve our understanding about uh, the management of uh, thyroid oxyphosis and hyperthyroidism. And also will help our uh, junior colleagues to take in the exams. And it will be very fruitful uh, for them as well. And thank you, sir, for, uh, for your very nice and excellent and elaborate talk today. And really, I appreciate it. And I personally like the way you have delivered uh, the teaching session today. Thank you so much, sir. And uh, I would like to thank the Brett of Fortune, who are the sponsor of this course for us. And I would like to uh, request all the attendees, all the participants, please uh, fill in the uh, form so we can improve the course. Uh, your feedback is very essential for us. And this is available a month. So from me, up sub ko may trap se Krishna Nagar Mishra Singh Barako. Assalamu alaikum. Waalaikumsalam, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Thank you, sir, for your valuable comments. And um, uh, Dr. Omar, aap kuch kehna chahte hain bhi? Are you there? Sir, Dr. Omar is our assistant professor from uh, department and. Uh, Dr. Omar, are you there? If you want to say something. <coughs> I think uh, Dr. Omar is not here. 
so i think if, if that is it then um, i would again reiterate that please give us the feedback from through the feedback form link which will be shared by mr nasir i again thanks uh, barrett and hodson very much for their kind support technical and all logistics and everything and of course in the end i am so much thankful and grateful to professor saeed mehr saab who took his valuable time from his such a busy schedule uh, sir and me both were busy in a uh, in an academic activity in the morning as well and uh, we know that how we rush to uh, you know our homes and uh, to 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 conduct this course and this activity as well and sir also has a lot of activity during the day uh, after this so oh, all the best wishes to you sir we will engage you again in future in our academic activities we'll hope to collaborate with you with you in the future as well uh, with that thank you so much uh, and uh, thanks uh, to all the participants for continuously you know participating in our sunday courses we see that the attendees are a bit less today uh, due to some reason maybe because usually we get 30 to 40 participants on on sundays but today it's a bit less so maybe um, there are reasons uh so we we'll see you again next week we have another lecture and uh, that will be between 3 to 4 pm uh and uh, see you all all the best and allah hafiz thank you allah hafiz allah hafiz everybody allah hafiz sir allah hafiz beta